On today's episode, we take a trip out east to talk about the Atlanta Gladiators and a name that may be familiar for our listeners. I talk about that and more on today's episode of Locked On Coyotes. Your Locked On Coyotes, your daily podcast on the Arizona Coyotes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Locked On Coyotes. I'm your host, Carl Pavlock. Before we get started, I do want to thank you for making Locked On Coyotes your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. Uh, I also want to mention that today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered with this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts. We have a very special episode of you today. We are going out east, as I said in the intro, talking some ECHL affiliate Atlanta Gladiators hockey. We're also going to be talking about Liam Kirk. And we have a special guest. We have Haynes Evans, the beat writer for the hockey writer. Uh, Also, Chirping Yotes, which is where I'm mostly known from. How are you doing today, Haynes? Doing well. I uh, appreciate you having me back on. I, I feel kind of a little special. I haven't been a guest on a podcast in a while, so uh, this is this is kind of fun. I was a little amped for this. I know it's taking us a couple of days to kind of get set up, but you know I'm excited to be here. It's fun to be on. It is. It is really fun to guest on a podcast, like especially if you host or co-host. Yeah, like, you, you were you were experienced a couple of me hosting a couple of the uh, Howlers and Growlers episodes. Those weren't real fun to put together. It was fun to it was fun to listen to Pat put them together. It wasn't so fun to put it together myself. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, I was on a Philadelphia Flyers podcast like um, last week, maybe two weeks ago. I can't remember. Um, but it was basically like. Oh, I don't have to do anything. I just have to show up and talk. <laughs> That's the easiest part of podcasting. <laughs> um, but the reason we brought you on um, is because you are in the Southeast. You yes. follow the Atlanta Gladiators more than I do. Um, and the thing that really like cued me in is there was a Gladiators game. Liam Kirk was there. You got a phenomenal picture back of the jersey. And I was just like, oh, we need to have hands on to talk about this. Plus, it's been a while. Um, I know you co-hosted for me back when Robin was uh, out uh, sick, I believe. Uh, Mm. So long ago, and I cannot remember. I I can't remember how long ago it was. It it, it was sometime last year, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, or or last season, rather. Probably still this calendar year. Uh, which just blows my mind. But yeah, need to have you back and we're going to talk. So so tell me, how are the Gladiators doing this year? Let's start that. Let's start big picture. So the Gladiators are just actually won last night against the South Carolina Stingrays. They won in overtime. Um, that currently put them atop of the South Division, which is not an easy division for fans on the ECHL this year. You have a lot of uh, really good teams up there. My hometown, Greenville Swamp Rabbits, are up in the top of the league. South Carolina Stingrays, who I've written for, up in the top of the league. The Atlantic Gliders top the league right now. Savannah Ghost Pirates are up there. It's yeah, forever blade. It's a whole carousel of teams right now, really just fighting for the top spot in, in the South. So, yeah, Atlanta's um, up and down years. You know, they have a lot of Coyotes roadrunners. That, um, if anybody follow me that I mentioned that are on the Gladiators roster right now besides Kurt. So uh, it was cool to kind of see him get into play. I've, you know, I've watched him before. I've, I'm, I saw Louis Domingue a few years ago, actually, back when he was in the, on the Gladiators when they were – originally affiliates with the coyotes years and years ago oh, yeah. so um to be able to see him again and this time be able to see liam kirk in person was it, it was a cool experience that that was back when they were the gwinnett gladiators correct yes, they were the gwinnett gladiators back in like 2011 12 area they're they're now atlanta to represent the city even though they don't play in the city of atlanta it doesn't make much sense but I mean, Atlanta is at least a bigger name than Gwinnett. Yeah, yeah, so. Gwinnett. yeah, yeah. You, it's a bigger draw. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember like when they signed the affiliate agreement, like this past off season. I was like, mm-hmm. 
Gladiators. That sounds familiar. The Atlanta part sounds off. And I was yeah. like looking and the the history of the Gladiators is is fascinating. Like, oh yes. The fact they started in like Alabama, yep. just kind of like left. Just an amazing story that are as uh, the mobile mystics and came to Atlanta and people have it's the longest hockey team they've ever had in this in, in Atlanta outside of the Thrashers and the Flames. And they just actually did a Thrashers night a couple nights ago. They donned the original Thrashers uniforms. I posted all about it. It was so cool looking. Thrash came back. They had the original inaugural season uniforms, which they had to get licensed from the NHL to use those. It was the logo. They had the socks. It was it was Blue Land came back. It was sold out crowd. Everybody was wearing their blue jerseys. It was it, they lost unfortunately, but it was nevertheless it was cool to see. It was cool to see the Thrashers come back for a night. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Like you know, I, I mostly stick to the NHL and echl teams do like come up especially like jersey nights yep. like but it's mostly like the warm-up jersey like oh yeah oh, this or is it's cool like thing the that they're nickelodeon night jerseys or yeah. it, i trust me i've seen a lot of really bad ones from working with the echl team before there there's some really terrible ones they do in the league and all that but yeah they they do a bunch of special jersey nights it's how they get the fans and it's how you get the extra money and all that I mean, I, I like them. There was a Blues Clues one that I really yes, liked. Yes, Gladiators um, did a Blues Clues night as well for their Nickelodeon night. That one was a, a childhood hit for me right there. I liked that one a lot. Uh, but, like, the Thrashers is just, like, such a, a like, known logo oh, yeah. oh, that, yeah. uh, I'm going to be honest, one of my big complaints about the Winnipeg Jets is they do nothing to honor nope. the Thrashers. They do no reverse retros to honor it. And I, and I understand that they honored the original Jets because the Coyotes don't have anything to do with the original Jets. The Coyotes, you know, kind of don't want to honor the original Jets. But I, I think at the same time, it's weird that you at least don't pay homage to Atlanta just because, I mean, there is a lot of guys still on that roster that, you know, in some way, shape, or form were on that original Thrasher's roster and all that. So yeah. that left. So, I mean, it's it sucks they don't pay more homage to them. I understand that, you know, why are you going to pay homage to a, a Southeast market team and all that that, you know, you relocate from? But, I mean – I guess it'd be no different than the Coyotes paying homage to a Western Canadian hockey team they used to be if they did it. Yeah, they they did it. And I will also say the Calgary Flames, the A on their logo is the it's Atlanta the Flames logo. Flames, yep, it's the Atlanta Flames A. Yeah, so so the the Jets absolutely could pay homage. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and, and hopefully they will. Uh, I think they're a little bit embarrassed by it. Like every time like a Winnipeg reporter talks about the team, they're like, Look, we all remember 1995 when the the Jets left, and you're like, "No, man, most of your audience was not alive then. No, uh, no. That that is not how hockey is supposed to work." No. Um, I would love to get them like to to honor that Thrashers, especially because, you know, let's be honest. Once the team relocates, there's just so much love for that original. Oh yeah, logo. like no one's saying you have to go back and you know do the logo or anything. But I mean, a jersey now they they did like a jersey in the old light blue style with the yeah, one yeah. sleeve and had Winnipeg down the side and you know it, they did more of the Jet logo on the as the main logo and the pa like you don't have to go full out Thrashers, but if you did like at least a color scheme and made the design of like a uniform, that's absolutely what asking for is just to pay some respect to the franchise that came before you. Yeah, do do classic Jets. Like logo and jersey because yep. I get that that's a big thing for you. But do like the the powder blue. Do yes. the do the what is it orange? Is it red? Uh, for no, the red? The, they had a, a really bad like burgundy alt for like like the last like three years. It was terrible. It was like yeah. Dallas Stars word mark. It said like Atlanta across the front. It had a whole bunch of weird striping. It was it was definitely their worst jersey in their history of the franchise. <laughs> Yeah, but honor that one because yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's Pace the worst one. Game. That's what everyone loves. Yeah. Uh just yeah. It, it's great. Uh I, I, I love seeing that. Like I like I have never been happier with an ECHL franchise than just honoring a team that does not get enough respect. Oh yeah. I love the Thrashers growing up, man. That was the closest team to me growing up. I wish the Atlanta still a hockey team. Atlanta's an hour from me. It would have been the – instead, I go to Raleigh. That's the closest for me now. Raleigh's a four, four-and-a-half-hour drive to Raleigh to go see a hockey game, and yeah. I've done it the last two years for the Coyotes. But Atlanta, it was great. My first ever hockey game, Atlanta Thrashers against New Jersey Devils. Big Marty Bedore fan. Got to see Marty Bedore in person. I still remember the Thrasher heads that would open up and fire would come out of them when they'd score for the intros. It was coolest thing ever it was going to atlanta for those hockey games i remember going to phillips arena all the time and you'd see the thrashers logos everywhere all over phillips arena and 
they just they don't get talked about a lot anymore. And it's sad because they may not have been the most successful team, but I mean they had some pretty I'm gonna be honest, they had some pretty badass logos and some and some cool colors like the whole blue and the you know the yellow and the burgundy, but then the light powder blue jersey that made no sense, but it was unique and it was different. Like it was just it was a cool look. It, it was something different out there. I wish it would have worked out better for Atlanta. Absolutely. Like it was it was definitely a time where like teams were experimenting with their jerseys. Yep. Like I remember the running coyote third jersey around that same time. And looking at it, I'm like, that jersey uh doesn't work on so many levels, but I love it because it's taking so many chances. Oh, yeah. And there are aspects of it that you see now, but like in its purest form, just unimaginably terrible in a way that I love. It's the same as watching like a bad movie. Uh, <laughs> anyways, we are going to keep talking about this and we're going to start talking about Liam Kirk as well. Uh, but first I do need to say that today's episode is brought to you by bet online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. It's where you can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball and the World Cup and hockey. They've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, which of course you do, you're listening to a sports podcast, of course you love sports podcasts, you can find those on BetOnline as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information. Head over to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online, where the game starts. And we're back. This is Carl Pavlock, joined by Haynes. Haynes, we're going to talk about Liam Kirk. And I think a lot of people were disappointed when he was first sent down. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't seem to really get a chance with the Tucson Roadrunners. He was a healthy scratch for most of the time. Um, and you don't see a lot of players go from the AHL to the ECHL. Mm -hmm. um, it happens. I know there are definitely players. I, you know, the player I always think of is uh, Dave Schlemko, uh, yep. who went from the CHL all the way up to the NHL, became a you know pretty solid NHL defenseman. But you don't necessarily see that drop. Um, kind of tell me what is what is the vibe like for Liam Kirk now? How is he playing in Atlanta? Is there a situation where he is like pouting or is he taking this as the opportunity to do well and show we can do? Yeah. So, you know, um, first off, Liam Kirk played a game for Tucson this year and he was sent down. And, you know, we do have to mention that last year he played eight games before suffering a season ending ACL injury, took him out for the year. And, and I know a lot of people are saying, you know, this is, this is a move that they're making. This shows that they have no trust in the guy. They don't have faith that he's part of the future's plans and all that. And, you know, it, you have to kind of look at it from both sides. For one, it, he's a seventh-round pick. It's yep. very, very likely that most seventh-round picks usually don't get viewed as guys that will make the NHL and be a long-term future piece for a team. That's just normally how it is if you're a seventh-round guy. Of course. But the fact that he's been so talked about, he's been he's worked his butt off since he's gone into Arizona. He played great and over in for the Sheffield Steelers. He played great in another year of juniors. He he's worked so hard to get where he is. And you know, people see this as oh the demotion. This is it. You know, if they really thought he was good enough for the future, why not play him in Tucson now? And I get that, but I also understand that Tucson is playing very good hockey right now, and you don't want to throw off chemistry by forcefully putting a guy in the lineup just because you see him as if he's part of the future and you want to you just want to play him. I understand you want to try to give him games, but at the same time, it's not right to the guys who are playing well now in Tucson that should be losing ice time. So it was a, it was a justifiable move. I understand that people you know say that he might be gone the trade deadline, and he might. But at the same time, I, I still think he has a very bright future here in Arizona. Um, and 13 games so far this season, he has five goals, six assists, 11 points for the Gladys this year. So he's he's playing fairly well. He in his first game he recorded a goal and the shootout winner. So he is definitely uh, been fitting in really well to Atlanta. And you know, like you said, you asked how. It is you know is he pouting? Is he taking this you know the wrong way? And 
and he's not. You know, he he did a podcast about a week after joining Atlanta, and they asked him what it was like to come here to Atlanta from you know living in 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 England and playing hockey over there, where it's you know just getting off. You know, more people are getting involved in the game, and then you come to Atlanta to an area in the southeast where people are slowly getting involved in the game. So he was really kind of looking at, you know, this is no different than where I've come from. I've understand to be in smaller hockey areas before where hockey may not be the biggest thing. So it's not like I'm coming to an area where no one cares about it, or I'm coming to an area where everybody there, like I'm coming to a, a similar area of where he was from. And, you know, he's, he's been real optimistic. He knows he's viewing this as, you know, a conditioning stint. He knows he needs the playing time. And he, he mentioned that, that he needs to get the ice time. He needs to get out there and he needs to play. So this is good for the Coyotes to be saying him down here. You know, he needs kind of that um, time and, you know, and it shows well right now. I mean, he's projected 51, he's projected 51 points in 61 games. Right now, it's on the pace that he's going. So he, he's projected to do fairly well this year in the ECHL if he finishes the year out, which is likely. Um, I think with some – if the Coyotes make some moves here, the trade deadline, guys are going to get called up. I think Kurt's probably going to find his way back to the AHL four seasons in. But he's having a good year. I don't think he's viewing this as anything negative. Um, he – you know, he's he's taking the stride by stride. He knows this happens. Guys have been, like you said, been sent to the ECHL and called up. Jordan Bennington is a big one that was a guy who went from the – AHL to the ECHL, back to the AHL, to the NHL to win a Stanley Cup. So yeah. nothing new. I, I don't think he's gone for the future. I could be proven wrong. I still think the guys view him as a guy for the future. He's definitely taught about every training camp, about being one of those dark horse guys to make the lineup. So I think this is good for him. I think it's a nice little conditioning stint. I think he gets back to the AHL this year, and I think in you know another year of conditioning, maybe in the NHL next season to the end of the season, I think it wouldn't be a shocker to see him in a year or two in the NHL playing. On yeah, yeah. Because, like, I mean, especially for a player like Kirk, you look at his development. Um, he had to deal with a season ending injury. Yep. He had to deal with COVID, which is just like, if you look at juniors players who were like playing during the COVID years, like, who, who knows what long term impact that is having on their development? We are seeing like players who are like, yeah, they lost an entire year. They fell in the standings. They fell in like any kind of prospect review. Now they're doing great. Um, so I, I don't think it's the end. And I do think that it, it kind of says something where the team is conscious enough of what Kirk needs that they're going to send him down. Because they could just keep him up and scratch him the entire time. They could just not give him ice time. Exactly. Let that contract go. Yeah. And, he, and he, I mean, yeah, real fast. I mean, you're right. People say that this is a bad thing for him. You know, they don't have trade. But like you said, they could be keeping an HL and scratch him every night. What does that do for his development? Coming yeah. off an injury, how does that help him if, if you keep him in the HL and you scratch him on a nightly basis? I mean, in the first, what, 10 games of the season before he got sent down, he, he played one game. Yeah. And what does that do for his development to help him? Sending him down, whether it's to the ECH or not, this is ice time for him. This is good for him. This gives him time to develop and work on his skills. And I watched him play, and he's very good looking and, and watching him play in person. His skills are very good. He's a guy who, in my opinion, looks better than 90% of the ECHL players, guys he's playing against. He he reads the play better, and it's understandable. You're watching a guy who got drafted in the NHL. That's no knock on anybody in the ECHL, but you know, you can tell he has a different skill level. And you know, he's not out there to just lolly guy around. He's taking this seriously. He wants to work his way back up to the ladder to the NHL. Nice. Yeah. I mean, absolutely agree. Um, and, and that's good, uh, especially when talking about players getting sent down. There are players I feel like, and we've discussed this on prior episodes, uh, Robin and myself, like there are players who just do not play as well in lower leagues for, yep. for whatever reason. They either think it's beneath them. They don't like play to the competition as well. Like it's, it's great that he is looking at this the right way. Um, we do need to take one more break and then we'll be back to kind of finish things off. Well, let's talk about the coyotes a little bit, uh, in the final segment, but I do want to get to this one message. And I do also need to say that this mention that this episode is brought to you by the NHTCA. Did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence. That's right. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every state, even in states where marijuana is legal. That means driving high can get you a DUI. And if you think law enforcement can't tell when you're driving high 
you're wrong. Your friends can tell. Your coworkers can tell. Even your parents can tell. Everyone can tell. So what makes you think that law enforcement officers don't know when you're driving high? Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response times and change how you perceive time and space. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. Because the bottom line is, if you feel different, you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. So remember, drive high, get a DUI. Paid for by NHTCA. And I do also want to say thank you for making Locked On Coyotes your first listen every day. Make sure to check out Locked On Sports today for the biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. Plus, instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. Carl Pavlock, Locked On Coyotes, joined by our special guest. Haynes, I have to ask, uh, we're talking about the ECHL. We mentioned the Roadrunners a little bit. Uh, how, how are you feeling about the Coyotes this year? Are you enjoying the games that you're watching? You do co-host a po- Coyotes podcast, so... I imagine you're watching a lot, but we yes. haven't had a chance to talk about it. No. Um, so y- y- there's things I've liked this year from the Coyotes. There's things I haven't liked, and there's things that I still think need to be, you know, kind of reset for fans that I don't think really get the picture. So, you know, I really like how the team's playing this year. You can tell it's a, di- it's a different roster based off of last year. You can tell they have a little bit more of a grit to them, a little bit more of a speed to them. And you're seeing, and you know, and guys are showing up and out there in games. They're not sitting down. They've only had about one or two games this year in which they've really just looked outmatched in the Oilers being one of them and all that. So other than that, they're playing competitive hockey. They're, they're having really competitive games. They're not letting themselves get out of it too far. They're pulling off some big wins and some really good teams beating Boston for the first time since 2011, which was in Prague. Um, so they're pulling off a lot of really impressive wins this season. They have Vegas tonight, a uh, really, really hot team this year. But um, some things I had like from them that, you know, everybody's going to have problems, as you know, I think that they're playing a little too well at times too. And I know what people are thinking, why would you say a team's playing too well? And, well, you, you know, this team is competing uh, not for the number one overall pick, but they are in a rebuild. Yeah. they're not expected to win. They're not, I wouldn't say they're not trying to win, but they're not trying to, you know, actively win as much as they can. You know, I, they're not, mine says not, let's go out there and lose. It's let's go out there and play harder hockey. And that's what fans want to see. If, during this rebuild, what I want to see is, I don't want to see losing after losing, but if, if we do lose, I want to see us compete and look competitive in a loss. I don't want last season where we were having opening night, seven to two loss to Columbus, you know, Eight nothing loss to Colorado. I don't want to see that. I want to see a competitive three two loss, competitive, uh, you know, one zero loss. You know, I, I want competitiveness from the team, and that's what we're seeing. But you know, at the same time, this is a team right now that is sitting, you know, second to last in the Central, but not insanely bad compared to how bad, say, Anaheim is doing, say how uh, Chicago is doing, say how bad like San Jose, Columbus, so and Philadelphia. So I, I wouldn't say they're playing amazing or I wouldn't say they're playing terrible, but I wouldn't say they're playing necessarily amazing at the same time, but I think they're playing a little better than what fans were hoping for. Um, especially if there was hope that the Coyotes land Bedard this year. So I, I, I thought about this a lot because uh, I have to interact with a lot of people who understand that it's a tank year. They're going for the first overall pick uh, and they're frustrated by the results uh, and I'm like, this is a bad team. They are doing as bad as they can. <laughs> I, I just, I never realized that the Anaheim Ducks would just be this. Two uh, regulation I, wins, and and they're out. They're eight wins. Two of them are regulation. The other six are overtime or shootout. I, I, I do not understand. Like, what is going on in Anaheim? Like, I, surpri- I mean, I, I see them as a New Jersey team. Uh, New Jersey, the last few years, has had a really good young team but they were a young team that was still trying to learn. the, And that's what the Coyotes are going to be next year. And, you know, building off what you said, people do have to understand it's a rebuild. This is like the last true year of tanking. Next year is going to still be a rebuild, but the team is going to try to be winning and all that. But it's going to still be losing because you're you're going to have a lot of guys from the HL next year are going to be getting chances. Victor Soderstrom could be up next year. 
Josh Doan, you know, for example, Dylan Gunther's going to be out there. Logan Cooley will be talked about. Liam Kirk will be on there. You know, Maverick Lamarus. There's a lot of guys that are going to get shots next year. So it's going to be a young team. It's going to be like a New Jersey model, like what Anaheim's doing. It's going to be a young influence. And it's going to take a year or two for those kids to really get stride in the NHL. You can't just expect them to go out and win right away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, Michael Carcone, uh, yep. he, he is definitely, I think, the player to watch in the AHL right now, yes. which is pretty interesting because Victor Sostrom is still there. Uh, Nate Smith is there. Like, yep. Jan, I, I, I did there. not think Smith would be like this far kind of out of it. Uh, Jan Yannick yep. also. Like, there, there's definitely going to be a youth movement, and there's going to be a learning curve with that. And, and that does kind of make me wonder, like, if Anaheim is going to come alive in, like, the second half, if they, like, finally, like, put everything together. Because uh, the Coyotes, I feel like, are going to get worse. They're going to be selling. Once the trade lot. deadline comes around, people yeah. people think we're winning too much now. Wait till after the trade deadline because it's it's going to be a lot of losing. After the, you're talking Ghost is going to – is is for sure on his way out. Chick is on his way out. You're going to see at least maybe a guy like Nick Bukestad maybe move. Nick Ritchie could be moved. I mean, it is going to be a lot of pieces going out at the trade deadline. And, I mean, a lot of great assets coming back. But, it is, yeah, if you don't think we're winning – if you think we're winning too much now, you don't have to worry about winning in the second half because there's not going to be much of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm starting to see national attention around Karel Vamelka, uh, yes. which is just like – uh no, please do like not do that. Vesna voting right now. I think he's uh he's he's like six or seventh in Vesna voting. Yeah, which is just insane. Uh, because he he was he was fine last year. Like I thought he was okay. Yeah, I thought he he would only do well with a solid backup. He yep. doesn't have that right now. He's got no. Ingram. Um, but it, it's just every time I talk to people, they're like, "Where did he come from?" And I'm like. The Czech second league? Yeah, and you got to give him credit. He never played a game in North America prior to coming to the Coyotes. Yeah. Never played a game. He spent his whole life in in, in, in Czech Republic. Yeah. And he comes over to the North America on a deal with the Coyotes, and everybody thinks, oh, okay, cool. Back up to, you know, uh, Prozatov in the AHL. Next thing you know, he beats out the guy who's expected to be the backup in, in Coronar, and, and instead here he is backing up Hutton, and then taking over Hutton's position. And now yep. is the guy viewed as the long-term future starter while we develop a goalie over the next few years. Yeah. I've, I'm just wondering when Prosvatov is going to take that next step. Like, speaking of, we talked about AHL guy or ECHL guys. Yep. He went, like, from the ECHL to the AHL super quick. Like, yep. that was just – I think he has, like, less than 10 games there. Uh, like, straight – I don't even know if he had a junior year. Uh, God, I need to look that up. Prosvatov was like junior. Probably played juniors for uh, the uh, Saginaw uh, Spirit. I'm pretty sure is it who he played for. He okay. played in the OHL, WHL. I can't remember exactly. He played juniors for about two years. I think he played juniors. Yeah, he he is like uh, this is his make or break year. That one year contract they gave him. This is is essentially his make or break year. He's got to show in the HL that he can be a reliable HL goalie. Or the Kaiser are going to move on. He was not a reliable HL goalie last year. Granted, he hasn't been great in the NHL either. It's not like he's been placed against the best teams. He's, he always seems to play like the best team in the league when he plays. But he's not – last year he was not a good HL goalie, and that's no knock on him. But it's hard to keep a guy in your future plans if, if he's not produced – if he can't keep together and, and down in the minors. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely, especially for a goaltender. Oh, yeah. Uh I think he has mostly played against the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Colorado Bay, Avalanche. Colorado and Vegas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which uh, I, I don't know what else you could really say about that. Uh, yeah, it's that, a really good way to uh, to kind of break your goalie in the NHL there by putting him up against like the three like three headed dragon of that of that right there. That seems a little a little hard to the development for your goalie to have him play those guys. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I hope he gets he gets a spot because he is definitely like I don't know who else is in the pipeline for goaltenders for the Coyotes. Hanson Thornton's probably the only other guy I could tell you right now. Thornton's like five years away. Like he's oh, yeah. still well, I mean, he's five away, but I would say if we're looking at goalies right now and who we think could be the guy going forward, it would probably be Thornton. There's not many other I, – I'm not going to say it's going to be – um. Oh, who am I trying? Dave Tindek. He's down yeah. in Atlanta as well, playing with the Gladiators. He looks like a guy who's probably going to spend most of his career in the AHL, ECHL. 
I really think Anson Thornton was a hyped up guy when we when we got him and he and he came to tryouts and he you know he got a contract. But I think yeah, I mean like you said we don't really have that it guy in the pipeline for the future, and that's alarming. You need that. Yeah. Uh, th- that could be a whole episode. We're going to have you back sometime <laughs> to talk about how oh, yes. the things that the Coyotes do not have in the pipeline, because <laughs> there is a lot. Uh, I am I am somewhat concerned about the pipeline. I am very curious to see how they're going to be drafting this next year. But oh, yes. uh, that's going to be it for us. Haynes, tell the people where they can find you and all the things you do, because you do a lot. Thank you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Haynes P. Evans. Uh, that is H-A-Y-N-E-S P. Evans, E-V-A-N-S. Um, I work for the Hockey Writers. You can find my work on there. I am the only Coyotes writer for the website. <laughs> Was with Pat Brown. He is working with the Coyotes now. Uh, so I am the only writer on there. So if you are curious how to find my work, just go to the Hockey Writers, click on Teams, go to Coyotes, and I am only articles on there for the last, like, three months so uh you can find me there you can find me on the chirping yards podcast i do that with grandy chase and tyler it's real fun we put out episodes try to get one out every week uh sometimes we're a little bit delayed you know schedules and all that but uh yeah i that's the biggest areas to find me i post everything from there uh always anybody can always reach out to me if you ever have questions about anything about the team want to talk about anything i'm always open my messages you always talk to me I appreciate you, Carl, having me on as usual. I really do love coming on and talking. It's been a while since we talked. I felt like I used to see you every week for Howlers and Growlers, and now <laughs> it's like we see each other every now and then. <laughs> kind of ordeal. I th- I think you guys had me on three times. So uh... it felt like we had you on a lot. You you were like the, like the emergency backup standby guy, always ready if we needed you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that that that's just like the thing I'm used to. Like being on a daily podcast, I'm like. I always need to be ready because there's going to be a podcast today. Uh, just when is the podcast going to be? Uh, anyways, you can follow the show at LO underscore Coyotes. Best place to get all my hockey opinions uh, is mostly on the Five for Howling Twitter. The word five, the number four, the word howling. And I do want to thank you for making Locked On Coyotes your first listen today. Now make sure to check out Locked On Sports today for your second listen. Pierre Bukowski brings you the... L- biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes you can get analysis and opinions before anyone else in the local or national media experts and insiders locked on sports today available on youtube and wherever you get your podcasts and of course follow haynes follow all of his shows and the hockey writers follow the the podcast wherever podcasts are found you know how podcasts work uh i always tell people how to find podcasts. I'm like, I I listen to podcasts. I know where the podcasts are, but thank you all for staying with us. Thank you for listening to this episode. Hope you're doing safe out there. Hope you're doing, you're staying healthy and don't forget to howl on.